Hey, what's up? It's episode 132, Pain Points of Wealth, and the economic data is really good. And from our perspective, good news, well, it's frankly, good news. So we're going to tell you why we like the economy right now. We're going to talk about the market action. Market's been selling off as we're getting to the dog days of summer here. And we're going to talk about your financial planning into the fall. Summer's coming to an end. Things are getting real. Are you financially fit to get ready for the rest of the year? We're going to talk about that. Check it out. We got a great show. Hey, guys, you ever notice that uh, when you study the charts of the Financial markets, every dip in history is viewed as an opportunity, except for the next one is only seen as risk. Well, you know, somebody told me the other day that you don't want to catch a falling knife. Um, <laughs> well, it's true. It's like the, the, you know, it's all of a sudden the markets are seeing more volatility. We've seen some selling this summer, finally some selling, right? I mean, the market was up huge from last October all the way through July, up like 28%. And now all of a sudden we're getting some selling. And of course, the bears are out in droves saying, okay, we're finally here. This is finally it. Economic data, it's going to be a big problem. The Fed's going to keep raising interest rate. Inflation's not going to come down. A recession's going to come next year. Everything's going to fall off a cliff. And that's what happens is, look, all these people were already wrong. Well, now they're just going to keep pushing their view out. And all of a sudden, you know, it's like, well, why should I trust you now? You've been wrong all year. Why is your insight any better now? But that's exactly what happens on Wall Street. You know, it's really it's really ironic, right? Uh, this time last year, everybody was looking for a deep recession. We've talked about it on the podcast week after week. But, you know, the reason rates are going up right now is not because we're anticipating the Fed continuing to raise rates. They're probably finished, if not really close. It's because the economy's booming. It's growing. <laughs> you know, the first month of uh, this quarter has been phenomenal to the point where GDP now, guys, is predicting 5.8% for the quarter. That's insane, actually. I mean, think about it. You know, you had everyone telling you that we're going to be in negative growth come this time this year or last year. And not only are we not in negative growth, but we're having outrageously high growth. In fact, like look at some of the economic data that just came out, right? You had housing starts came in better than expected last week. Industrial production came in better than expected last week. Um, you know, you, you just had like one number after another just coming in better than expected. And I don't care what anybody says. You know, there's been this mantra on Wall Street that good news is bad news. Bad news is good news. Good news is always good news. And I said it last year when they're like, well, the unemployment numbers keep coming in, uh, you know, better than expected. That's going to be bad news because the Fed's going to keep rates higher longer. I, it's always good news to have low employment. People have jobs. That's a great thing. <laughs> it's outrageous the way they spin things on Wall Street. Yeah, you know, I was talking to a client of mine yesterday. He owns a, uh, a flower business out in, in Western Pennsylvania, and he was saying that not only is he coming off his best year, you know, he's still having that issue of trying to get good people. He said, you know, it's just it's just so hard to get people because the labor market's so strong. Yeah, it really is. I mean, the demand for labor, um, you know, exceeds the number of job openings. Um, that's probably going to continue, Chris. I mean, it, I think that's one of the concerns that Wall Street's been dealing with is you're seeing a lot of raises, especially from union workers. But, you know, union workers in the private sector now are only 6% of, of the working population. Yeah, and it's almost like, you know, that Goldilocks scenario where it's like, okay, wages are still going up, but they're moderating. So, you know, they're not going up as fast, which is good for the inflation numbers, right? If you don't have to pay your workers exorbitantly more money, that means that companies don't have to continue to raise their cost on you and me. We're, we're really getting that soft landing um, that the Fed told us they were going to pretty much provide for us. But it's just amazing how the pundits can keep just trying to spin it negatively. And we'll probably get it wrong again. That's the best thing about Wall Street. They'll probably be wrong and uh, they'll pretend like they weren't wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's a hard day's life in the, in the life of the people are looking for a hard landing. But, you know, I don't blame them. They see the inverted yield curve. It's predicted financial crises all through my career. And we had one, right? We had three regional banks fail. Uh, so it did its job. But now, you know, instead of inverting, it's kind of, I don't know, what's the right word, guys? Is it disinverting or uninverting? <laughs> um, you know, I mean, what, what's happening now is that 10-year yields are going up, but the two-year staying pretty steady. So it, it's kind of like we're going to get a flattening of the yield curve by intermediate rates, you know, going up to normal. Not 
not outrageously high. These are normal rates if you look at history. Yeah, I always think it's funny and talking to my clients are saying how rates are just astronomical right now. And these are people that lived through the 70s and the 80s where, you know, in some cases, mortgage rates were up to 18 percent. Yeah. yeah. How about uh, how about we used to get 19 percent on a money market fund, Chris, and the 30 year treasury, zero coupon treasuries were 14 and a quarter percent. I had one pension fund held out for 14 and three eighths. They never got it. They sat in cash for years waiting for that one eighth of a percent to come back. Should have locked that in for 30 years. Yeah. Oh, it was a no brainer. Yeah. Well, it's a great point because, you know, the 10 year treasury as we're recording this is like 4.33 percent. Right. It's, a, it's the highest it's been since 2007. That's a long time. But meanwhile, even if the 10 year goes up to like 4.75 percent, let's just say, because the economy is strong. That's the average it was during the 2000s. <laughs> like, so that's a normal rate to have on the 10-year treasury. And guess what? The economy actually grew. So why this time around won't the economy grow? So I, I think, you know, if anything, maybe seeing a little bit higher longer-term rates is probably a healthy indicator that the economy is doing really, really well. But no one's talking about it that way. They're just talking about it as rates go up, growth's going to come to a halt. Uh, we're going to come into some dire recession. Nobody's going to do anything. We're going to sit at home and we're going to cry about it and watch the markets just like collapse. But that's well, not really know, how guys. I always say that stocks are the slaves of earnings, right? Of profits. We just had our fourth consecutive quarter of rising quarter to quarter, you know, earnings. And if you're sitting there waiting for the trough, you know, in earnings, you missed it, right? It's already turned the corner. Not only have earnings been going up four consecutive quarters, but the analysts are increasing their earnings estimates, you know, versus cutting them where they were this time last year. Yeah, no, it's a great point. Um, and if you go into next year, I mean, earnings growth can be like double digits on the S&P 500, right? That's real growth. And meanwhile, I think, you know, we're in that camp of deflationists, if that's even a word, <laughs> where if you look at the inflation numbers every month, right, like shelter is a big component of that. Real-time shelter costs have come down a lot, meaning rents are starting to actually moderate around the country. That hasn't shown up yet in those inflation numbers. That's eventually going to show up. And as we mentioned before, labor starting to moderate. And if you start looking at the outlook from consumers on inflation, it's come down a lot. So all the signs are pointing to we're going to have even more moderate inflation over the course of the next 12 or 24 months. Again, that's phenomenal news for the economy. And the other thing is you're seeing productivity increase, right? So if you can get productivity to continue to increase, that's where you get, you know, higher uh, production, higher earnings without inflation, right? By getting more out of each worker. And that's been a good trend. I hope it's a multi-year trend. It's, it appears to be. Well, you know, I think the productivity increase is related to strictly to the fact that Ryan's starting to go back into the office and actually working again. <laughs> well, that gets back to that good news, bad news, Chris, right? Well, news is bad, so I'm going to go away on vacation. News is well, good, so I'm going to go away on vacation. I'm just glad he's here. You know, it's nice to see him. <laughs> I just like the fact that Chris thinks I actually work even actually work when I'm in the office. You know, that's great. I'm great. I'm, I'm doing some. I'm creating the right illusion, apparently. Oh, um, <laughs> here's But say. no, no, you're right. The productivity the productivity trends have gone up a lot, right? People are starting to go back to the office, and believe it or not, people are actually more productive in the office. But, you know, that coupled with, to your point, Bob, you know, the, the great thing about all this AI talk or generative artificial intelligence is the fact that it's going to help this labor shortage that we have, right? And that's going to help every industry. So, you know, we talk about this a lot, but it's like, it's not just about buying NVIDIA. It's about buying every sector out there because this rally is broadening out, right? Tech has gotten hit in the last couple of weeks, but look at energy stocks. They've been rocking since June. Look at industrial stocks. They've been rocking since June. So there's just lots of places to put your money, and it's not all about tech. I mean, we pretty much pound the table on that every week. Funny you talk about tech, Rye. You know, tech did have a good bounce there for a little bit. But funny thing is that year over year, energy's actually outpaced tech. All right, so accelerating economy, rising earnings. Sounds like good news to me. You know why? Because that's exactly what it is. So if long-term rates have peaked, which I think they have, and short-term rates have peaked, then... Uh, I think the stock market looks very attractive right now. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 132, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you've saved over a million dollars and you want a more hands-on approach, Bob, Chris, and I will run for you our total financial master plan, and we'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review we literally look at everything. There's no firm out there that will do this work up front. In fact, we'll build you your own personalized financial portal, give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, 
will hone in on every issue you need to address today, whether it's an income plan for retirement, how to draw from your portfolio, how to take Social Security, how to factor in inflation without running out of money. We'll look at diversification. Has your portfolio been a yo-yo the last two years if markets have been all over the place? Or have you been sitting in cash, paralysis by analysis, trying to figure out what to do with your money? We'll put together a full investment game plan, tie it back to your goals, show you how to grow your money, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products like annuities, mutual funds, brokerage products, insurance products. We'll literally go through every investment you own, show you how to reduce the cost on your entire portfolio and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook. If you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And Bob and Chris, you know, it's always a little sad, a little melancholy. We're at the end of summer. Uh, Chris, I know you're up there in Rhode Island for a couple more weeks, but the days are getting a little bit shorter, right? Those mornings are a little bit darker. And, you know, it's that change of seasons that happens. And it's like, ah, I got to get back to reality. And I feel like with your financial planning, it's the same thing. So I thought we could talk a little bit about how to get yourself prepared for the fall, getting back to reality, getting your financial life in order, and just some of the steps that we help our clients with that our listeners should be thinking about as well. I think everybody's got to remember that time passes and markets operate. And by the way, neither cares how you think or feel. Um, so, you know, we've had a really good year in equities. The bond market's been struggling still, even though the rates are very good. Uh, so, you know, make sure you're, you're targeted asset allocation. Make sure you're aligned with that. Now, I know with my clients, I've been adding a lot more to bonds as dividends and interest come in because, We've made more in stock so far this year. Yeah, no, it's a great point in that over-concentration you know, in tech that a lot of us have. You know who you are out there. Um, you're feeling that pain in the last couple of weeks because tech has just sold off a lot, right? And we saw this last year, too. Technology stocks got hit the most. They've had a big run this year, but it's kind of like a yo-yo effect. So it's a great time to rebalance your portfolio. As we've talked about, the rally starting to broaden out time to broaden out your exposure as well. It's a really good time to do that. Yeah, and you know, one thing, if you're concerned about things like capital gains, you know, you do own some of those big tech names, you know, there's always the opportunity, especially if you're more charitably inclined, you're actually able to donate appreciated stock. So doing that as opposed to cash, you know, solves two issues. It takes some risk off the table, but, you know, it also allows you to, uh, to help out the, uh, the greater good. You know, and I'll tell you what, guys, it's always smart to prune your portfolio when things are good. You know, I was just looking at, some data uh, from the government and their revenues have dropped dramatically from last year. And they're kind of scratching their head, but it turned out a lot of people panicked out of the market last year when we, you know, we had that uh, pending recession. And so a lot of government receipts came in. You know, I don't know about you, you know, why voluntarily give the government more money? No, it's a great point. And right now it's a good time to start thinking about those end of year taxes, like good time to start thinking of things like Roth conversions because you probably have a good idea what your income is going to look like this year. Good time to talk to your accountant about is it good, if you're in a low tax bracket this year, maybe it's a good time to take some of that money that's in IRAs, convert it to Roth so it's tax free or any kind of contributions you can make up or catch up on before the end of the year in your 401ks, retirement accounts, or even setting up a retirement account if you're uh, self-employed. So there's a lot of tax tweaks that you want to start looking at now. Don't wait all the way into December because it might be too late in December to do all the planning. The other thing, too, is, I mean, especially with rates going up, you know, municipal bonds have looked a lot more attractive. You know, a lot of times when we look at some of these portfolios that commit every month that are not tax efficient, you know, they're in higher tax brackets. They own these taxable bonds and they're paying a lot of extra taxes on the interest that they wouldn't necessarily have to if they owned a municipal bond tax portfolio. That's a really good point, Chris. And it's, uh, you know, you can also look at tax losses, right? If you have any any losses in any part of your portfolio, it's a good time to do some tax swaps. Uh, which to me, I can't believe is, is, is allowed, but uh, you got to take advantage of every opportunity that's out there. Oh, yeah, you have to do that. And also, I mean, great point on the, we're talking about the bond market a lot in the first segment today. And I know you're getting that 5% on your money market, your treasury fund, and it feels so good. If you start looking at the interest rate markets out next year, the futures market, most experts are predicting that interest rates are going to start to come down. So maybe you're getting 5% today, 
That might be 3% next year. Meanwhile, you can lock into a longer-term bond portfolio, uh, you know, paying 4 or 5%. You can start to avoid some of that reinvestment risk that a lot of you have right now. I don't know. Higher rates for longer, that sounds pretty good to me. Um, and, you know, one of the other things I've noticed, and I've been asking my clients about this every review that we do, is just making sure that their, their wills, their estate plan, their living wills are all up to date. And what I'm finding is a lot of them haven't updated in 5 to 10 years. So, you know, one thing, if you haven't looked at your will or even have a will, it's definitely something you want to look into. Yeah, you got to look at your beneficiary forms on your accounts, which we do for our clients to make sure that the people they want to inherit their money is still the same people. Uh, you know, look at the trustees and the uh, guardians that you've named for maybe minor children. Uh, you don't want to have somebody who doesn't like you take over for you with your children if you're not around. So there's a lot of little things that need to be reviewed. Not just every year, but you know, yeah. every every couple of years. Well, you know, Dad, I looked at I recently looked at your uh, IRA beneficiaries, and Ryan's still listed there, so you might want to get that changed. Hey. <laughs> I say I had good news for both of you. I went through both of your retirement accounts, and I updated it to make me a hundred percent beneficiary of all of it. So it's, uh, you know, you guys have no worries with your estate plan; it's been taken care of, which is that great. Just tells me I got more spending uh, to do. <laughs> really a good thing that requires a wet signature, pal. Yeah. That's not getting past me. <laughs> well, the other the other issue, too, is right now um, for, for a lot of you right now, if you have a bigger estate, is that estate tax credit, which is if you file jointly right now or with your spouse is something around twenty six million dollars. That's going to go down to more like twelve million dollars uh, at the end of twenty twenty five. So there's a lot of proactive planning for gifting right now, especially if your estate is starting to balloon. We're doing a lot of that planning for a lot of folks right now. But this is the time to start looking at that as well. You know, we're finding a lot of estate planning issues that a lot of you have that aren't being addressed. And, and it's a big hot button right now we're finding with a lot of our clients. Um, and it's something that you probably should need to be looking at, too, depending on the size of your estate. It really does. It does depend on the size of your estate. And then you have to look at your family dynamics, right? I mean, it's, you know, we all hope that our children marry uh, someone who's going to be there with them for the rest of their lives. But let's face it, guys, there's a 50% divorce rate in this country for first marriages, and I think it's even higher for second marriages. Um, and we've seen a lot of horror stories, right? We've seen where, you know, a child's uh, lost their spouse through divorce, and, you know, they, they want to come after everything. You know, there's there's nothing worse than a spouse that's been spurned. You know, in that case, you might want to think about, you know, putting a trust in. Um, again, it requires more sophisticated planning, more thought, and, you um, you know, when you're compounding your money over your lifetime, your net worth is a lot higher than you think. So you better take inventory and, and make sure that under the current tax rules, you're not giving anything away. Yeah, look, this, now is the time to do it. And if you probably gathered from this episode, hopefully it's just those small tweaks that make a huge difference uh, when it comes to your financial life. So don't wait on it. Don't procrastinate. Uh, September's around the corner. Start making these changes now or start looking at where the changes need to be made in your financial independence plan. That's the recipe for success. I think Nick Semenik says it best, guys. Right, our CPA buddy down in Florida. Render under Caesars, that's which is Caesars. But don't give them any of yours. All right, it's a hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, the net interest paid by the government has continued to rise rapidly along with interest rates since early last year. The outlay rose to a record $627 billion over the 12 months through July. Just before the pandemic, it was only $377.5 billion. Man, oh, man, that deficit and interest rates are becoming a problem. Yeah, that's one of the biggest big problems that the government faces right now is that with all the debt that they've accrued, um, you know, the interest payments are going up because interest rates are rising, right? So we love interest rates for savers, not for borrowers. You want to be a saver, not a borrower like the U.S. government. Yeah, the deficit is getting real. Definitely something that we're keeping an eye on here at Payne Capital. Chris, Apple is the most profitable company in America, reaching almost $100 billion in profits in 2022. It outpaces the profit leaders in both the energy and financial sectors combined. Furthermore, at the end of 2022, its net profit margin stood at nearly 25%. Man, oh man, that's a big company. Yeah, that's a lot of iPhones for sale, but I'll tell you, as an investor, that doesn't sound really cheap to me. I think uh, your money's better suited investing somewhere else. Wow, Chris, spurning Apple. I think that's uh, it's never a good decision. So uh, <laughs> Tim Cook, is uh, he's, he's listening. <laughs> Bob, 
The total returns, I love these stats, we give them all the time, but the total returns of 10,000 invested in the S&P 500 between January 1, January 1, 2003, 20 years ago, through December of this past year, would have been 64,844. You would have averaged an annualized return of 9.8% a year. Man, 2003 doesn't feel like that long ago. If an investor had simply missed the best 10 trading days over that time frame, this is over 20 years, you would have lost 50% of your return by the end of last year. That investor would have only had 29,000 versus that 64,000. Man, oh man, timing in the market is just treacherous. Yeah, I love that stat, right? The only thing you need to know about being a long-term investor is you never interrupt compounding of your money you know, intentionally. Uh, I'll never forget one of my clients' children had graduated from Wharton and knew more than I did. And uh, one day he called me up and he said, uh, you know, we need to get out of the market. It's going down. And I gave him the stat. And he said, well, what if we missed the 10 worst days? I said, no, you don't get it. I don't know what the 10 best days are going to be. I certainly don't know when the best, <laughs> worst 10 days are going to be. You know, this is crazy. Um, but of course, you know, when you're young and you're highly educated, suddenly you know more than somebody who's experienced. <laughs> Sounds like Chris. Um, no, but I, 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 highly well, educated. Wasn't you, highly, right? educated <laughs> highly educated is a stretch. But no, I think the, the bottom line here is, <laughs> look, I mean, what you want to think about is, look at last year, right? Um, everyone was telling you that the market was going to sell off. We we're going to go into recession. Had you sold out of your portfolio and you missed that move from October to July this year, that's a 28% return. You just don't get it back. Marking timing is treacherous, period. Yeah, but think about all the taxes you didn't pay to the federal government, right? I mean, the government needs your help. So <laughs> they need people to panic every once in a while. Fair point. Fair point, Bob. Hey, hope you enjoyed episode 132, Pain Points of Wealth. If you like our podcast, love our podcast, you probably love it. Please give us that five-star rating on iTunes. Leave us some comments there. Tell people how great our podcast is. If this is on Spotify. You can subscribe. If you're watching this on YouTube right now, you can like the episode, subscribe to our channel, click that notification bell to be updated every week of all our new content. Your support gives us the ability to continue doing this podcast. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind.